Well, um, you know, just to tie up a couple of points on SART, because I don't think I went over them last time. Uh, you know, for SART, then, our choices are free whether we like it or not. In other words, he says we uh, are free to make our choices. Again, if, if our choices are conditioned by a future vision we have for who we want to make ourselves into. Um, uh, again, I said like Constantinople, he uses that as an example that uh, the decisions, the choices that the Emperor Constantine made in building that city were not con conditioned by something in the past, by his causal past, but by the vision he had for what he wanted to build. And you could say the same thing for that building across the street, which was just finished at the beginning of this year. So he says it's not our causal past that determines our decisions. We determine them by uh, deciding what we want to make ourselves into and making those free choices that are consistent with our future vision of who we want to be. And so he says... Um, this gives us terrific responsibility. We are nothing more than what we make of ourselves, as Sartre says. And not all of us want to accept that responsibility. He says that uh, we might take some comfort uh, in saying we're not really responsible for our actions because they're conditioned by our past, whether genetics or environment or uh, the laws of nature. For Sartre, for us to claim that we're not free and, de and that our choices are somehow determined is for us to act in bad faith, to bring ourselves down to the level of things, what he calls uh, um, etre en soi, existence uh, in itself but we are existence for ourselves, etre pour soi in the French. And so he says we shouldn't be relegating ourselves to the status of things. So you can see what Sartre would think of, of a determinist like the Holbach. Oh. No, Friday is, this is the last class day though we're oh. reviewing. No. Uh, 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 uh. Well, I'm going to start again. Uh, so, so anyway, may, tying up a few points on Sartre. So, so what he says is, even if we want to escape our responsibility uh, for making free decisions, we are free and responsible for them whether we like it or not. So that's kind of the, the root of, of uh, why he says that as human beings we are condemned to be free and we have to basically deal with that. Um, now, I, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this word facticity, but here I think Sartre gives the game away when, um, you know, because he says there are things that we can't do, right? We can't choose to drink cyanide and survive. You know, I can't walk across North Avenue not looking at traffic and get run over by a bus and have it not do anything. Um, you know, I can't jump out the second floor window, flap my arms and fly. You know, Sartre says there are certain things we can't do. Well, when I took a, a, a whole semester graduate course on issues, well, they called it action theory, but free will and determinism, my graduate school professor said, well, when Sartre is discussing all this stuff, well, where does the body come in? Well, 
he pretends as if, uh, you know, what goes on with our bodies has nothing to do, and he deter you know, denies that we have any pre-existing human nature of the sort that philosophers all the way back from Socrates and Plato through Aristotle through Descartes wanted to look for, a fixed human nature. He denies that we have that, says we make our own human nature from scratch, but in talking about facticity, that there are things about us that we cannot change, I think he gives the game away. I mean, he basically says, yes, there are some things. And, and you want to say, well, Sartre, isn't the fact that I can't change some of these things, that I can't flap my arms and fly, that it's going to affect me if I try to walk across the street and get hit by a truck or a bus, that I can't drink arsenic or uh, cyanide? survive. Don't these have to do, Sartre, in part with the fact that I have a fixed human nature that's already there and determined for me and that my body has something to do with that fixed human nature? So in ignoring some of these things, I, I think he uh, ignores what are obvious objections to his claim that there's no fixed human nature. Uh, so, uh, okay, so that's all I'm going to say to tie up a few points on uh, Sartre. Um, Bentham and Mill, I, I'm going to uh, kind of jump around here because there are really parts of two review sheets that you see here. The ones that are bullet pointed are different. Questions from the ones down below, but they all relate to Bentham and Mill. So for consequentialist theories, what's the relationship between an action's result and its moral rightness or wrongness? Well, for consequentialist moral theories, like ethical egoism, some of you wrote on it, uh, ethical and psychological egoism for your paper, and utilitarianism, the consequences, the results of what we do are the only factors to be considered and the only things that determine whether what we do is morally right or wrong. Nothing else matters but future consequences. And that becomes a criticism of these theories, that they can't take anything from the past, like whether I made a promise, like whether I did a good job and deserve a promotion because I did a good job in the past, or like whether a criminal should be punished for the horrible thing that they did in the past because anybody who does something that horrible deserves to be punished. The utilitarians can't can't reason like that. Um, I, I mentioned that it's the reigning theory of punishment, but all utilitarians can give as a reason for punishment are reasons that have nothing to do with whether or not somebody deserves to be punished for what they did. They can't capture the note of, of desert. Their reasons for punishment are forward-looking. They can only give reasons that have to do with the future consequences. In other words, of saying that the results for society and for people affected are better than in terms of saving pain and suffering and maybe even giving the punished person a better life if they reform themselves than the pain and suffering you cause the punished person, right? So, so utilitarian reasons for punishment focus on future consequences, like the better consequences for society. If we keep this person locked up, uh, we protect society from them, and they can't cause pain and suffering by committing future crimes. By deterrence, if we... Uh, 
punish, say, a rapist harshly, that may deter future rapists. And, and so the pain of punishing that person is more than compensated for by the benefits in preventing future crimes. Or if we rehabilitate the person, they're not going to commit more crimes, and they may even have a happier life uh, if they go straight. Um, you know, so utilitarianism. Pardon? Well, um, Uh huh. Well, well, yeah. I guess uh, stuff like that would come into play, right? Uh, may, maybe in in reforming them or in uh, future deterrence. Um. So. So consequentialist theories are the only thing we looked at. We have not looked at any non-consequentialist views, but. Uh, basically, non-consequentialist moral theories can take into account consequences, but they deny the consequences tell the whole story. There may be other factors like whether a promise was made. Um, you, you know, for instance, in utilitarian reasoning, um, and I'm not doing much on act and rule utilitarianism, but note it says, how can act utilitarianism justify breaking a promise? Well, here's a stock philosopher's example, but it gets a point across. I mean, suppose uh, you're at the bedside of a dying friend who, and you're a Benthamite, and they say, look, I know I'm dying, you know, I didn't have much uh, in stock for the banks. Uh, I have $50,000 in this mattress under me. And when I pass away, I want you to promise that you'll take this $50,000 and give it to my only surviving relative, my nephew. Now, I know you might not like that because you know he's, a, he's an inveterate gambler and womanizer. But he's my only uh, living relative, and that's what I want you to do. And you say, fine, I'll promise. Well, the thing is, for a utilitarian, the only thing that matters is bringing about the greatest balance of good versus evil with what you do. And suppose you broke your promise to that dying man as a Benthamite because you decided that more benefit would come to society uh, from that money, that $50,000, if you took it instead and uh, you're not going to keep it yourself, but you donated it, say, to a children's hospital, right? You'd leave a lot of, alleviate a lot of pain and suffering, maybe give some children who would be cured happier lives, uh, better than giving it to um, his profligate nephew who would blow it on gambling, wine, women, and song, right? Uh, might me well, it looks like utilitarian would say the right thing to do morally is to break your promise because it results in better consequences for everyone effective. But, you know, non-consequentialist theories can point to the past and say, well, if you made a promise, then you ought to keep it. But when did you make a promise? Well, if you made a promise, you made it in the past. Um, and they also worry about violating uh, people's autonomy and their rights. So at any rate, um, So consequentialist moral theories can only look ahead to consequences. Non-consequentialist views can take other things into account. But we just didn't have time 
really when they restructured our syllabus a few years ago, I used to do Kant's moral theory, but there's so many things they wanted us to cover that by the time I got finished covering the bases of what they wanted us to cover, there wasn't a, uh, as much time for me to do some things that I wanted to squeeze in. Uh, okay. Um, now, we saw that when they're talking about promoting future good consequences, and the principle of utility basically says that on balance, uh, what you want to do is promote the greatest balance of good versus bad consequences for all affected. Um, there's the consequentialist part. But the way the original utilitarians defined good, and remember there are two readings on utilitarianism that are highlighted in your, um, you know, supplementary readings, which you can print out and bring with you to the exam. Um, the original utilitarians, when they defined the principle of utility, like when Bentham does it in that long convoluted definition that I read in class, he told you what he wants good to be. He interpreted it hedonistically. For a hedonist, the only thing that is good in and of itself is pleasure or happiness. Now, we went over this before. And so basically, he called the principle of utility the greatest happiness principle. Our sole moral obligation is to make those choices that on balance result in the promotion of more happiness versus unhappiness for everyone affected by what we do. That's paraphrasing uh, Bentham's principle. And he says, that includes personal moral decisions as well as public policy decisions. So you can approach the, the case of the Bakun Dam as a case where you're figuring things out hedonistically, or you're balancing out the pain and suffering of the 10,000 displaced natives and the animals in the forest because they counted too, their suffering counted too for Bentham, against um, the happier lives that you would bring to maybe hundreds of thousands or millions of people who would be benefited by now having more available electricity at a cheaper price. So now they can run labor-saving appliances in their homes. They can cool them with fans and air conditioning. They can, uh, you know, have jobs that weren't available before to give them better lives because now factories can be built because there's more available electricity. So that's one way to look at that. Um, must one be a hedonist to be a utilitarian? The answer is no. Uh, more modern utilitarians recognize uh, happiness or pleasure as good in itself, but they also say there are other things that are good in themselves. Um, Jonathan Glover is one of those. And some of those options are in the PowerPoint. So they recognize what within themselves? That, that there are other goods besides just pleasure and happiness like knowledge as an unqualified good, like satisfaction of human preferences. Uh, the, the thing is, <coughs> when Mill says that it's better to be Socrates dissatisfied than a fool or a pig satisfied, to try to defend hedonism, he actually abandons hedonism, because he's saying it would be better for Socrates to have a lower quantity of happiness. He's dissatisfied, right? But he's got a higher pleasure of discussing philosophy with his friends than it would be for Socrates to just have 
a greater quantity of a lower quality pleasure like eating and drinking. Uh, and so the bottom line there is whatever makes Mills higher pleasures, higher in quality pleasures, valuable in and of themselves, it's not just pleasure or happiness because there's a lower quantity of that. Well, to say that basically, I mean, this is an abstract point, but to say that is to say that there are other standards being sneaked in. There are other things of value. And more modern utilitarians like Jonathan Glover are pluralists. They recognize a plurality of uh, standards of value. Whereas uh, the modern day utilitarian Peter Singer is more or less an old fashioned Benthamite hedonist. So you don't need to be a hedonist to be a utilitarian. You can recognize a plurality of standards. Again, if you're used to thinking of moral right and wrong as abstract principles off in the nature of the universe or in the mind of God, then some of this talk is going to seem very foreign to you. But, you know, I remind you that this was the way they thought they could respond to some of Hume's criticisms about morality by saying if we can get morality and moral decisions down to earth, we can once more talk about how we can rationally argue over the rightness and wrongness of a moral um, decision. You know, where it's for Hume, everything becomes individually subjective. Reason gets taken out of the picture. Um, this is an attempt to put moral reasoning back. Uh, so, okay, we, we talked about Bentham's hedonistic calculus and the problems with it. Probably worth reviewing that, you know, the problem is that pains and pleasures are subjective. Um, in other words, for things like what's to count as a foot or a meter or a yard or a, a, a degree Celsius, you know, we can intersubjectively verify things because we're talking about something out here. When we're talking about pains and pleasures, we're talking about people's inner psychology. So while Bentham thought we could quantify pains and pleasures in terms of a countable unit, a hedon, it's very hard, if not absolutely impossible, to establish any objective standard for what counts as one hedon's worth of pleasure or, pain, or minus one hedon's worth of pain. So again, uh, that's one of the weaknesses of Bentham's calculus that, in other words, if you don't know what's to count as one hedon, how can you tell how many you have? And the problem is establishing objectively some way to specify what's to count as one hedon. So Bentham was too optimistic to think we could talk about these things quantitatively. However, you can get around this problem of specifying a countable unit by marrying utilitarianism with the accounting technique of a cost-benefit analysis. And so you basically say that the right policy decisions for society on the, are those which on balance produce more economic benefits than costs. And if you, so you can also look at the issue of whether to build something like the Bakun Dam in strictly economic terms as a utilitarian. Say, well, okay, there are certain economic costs to building this 
you know, the, the money it's going to take to relocate people, the money it's going to take to clear forests and, and the actual building of the dam. But once you get that accomplished, you've got a structure that's going to provide you electricity naturally just by the force of the water running through these channels maybe for the next 50 or 100 years along with the economic benefits that provides. So, you know, I think it's factors like that that made us build these things in things like this Tennessee Valley and the Hoover Dam out there in what, Colorado um, in, in the 20s and 30s and, and, and that make even developing nations now build them a few years ago. As I mentioned, I think earlier, um, China put online the largest hydroelectric dam in the world recently, in the past few years. The one we saw in the video was built in the late 1990s. So, so you can talk about a cost-benefit analysis. Um, so again, how did Bentham Mill differ? for Bentham, pains and pleasures are all the same if their quantity is the same. Mill, uh, and, and, and we said the criticism of this was that it gives, that utilitarianism becomes a moral theory that gives us a very low view of human nature. If, if the pig out there in the field gets as much happiness and satisfaction from its daily allotment of slop as you do from reading Maya Angelou for a couple of hours or something more highbrow, uh, then for Bentham, the, those two pleasures are on a par. Well, people criticize utilitarianism saying this, this makes no difference between us and the pig out there in the field. So Mill tried to respond by saying there are qualitatively higher pleasures. The pleasures of intellect and imagination are higher than the pleasures of mere sensation like eating and drinking. Um, you know, and uh, so he introduced qualitative distinctions. But as we said, this effectively meant he abandoned hedonism, even though he was trying to defend it. Because if we say it's better to have a lower qual quantity of pleasure, but a higher quality pleasure, like discussing philosophy or reading Maya Angelou or something, then um, whatever makes these higher pleasures more valuable, they're not. It's not just pleasure. Now, Mill also got criticized because what's he going to think are the higher pleasures? exactly the kinds of things that a sophisticated 19th century British intellectual should consider the higher pleasures, right? Reading novels, reading poetry, you know, uh, go, going to uh, classical music concerts or something. And so he got criticized as being elitist. Um, and he probably was. So anyway. Uh, okay. Any, I know. Comments, questions, whatever. Again, I go through these reviews pretty quickly. That's why I record them. But I basically was following what you see in front of you, although I was jumping around because I've got two different ones and they don't, you know, they're not in the same order. But, uh, you know, basically, I, I would, you know, re review the PowerPoints. I mean, actually try to review some for the test, even though you're going to have materials available to you, because um, you won't have an unlimited time to do this in. Now, and again, it's very important for you all, since your class normally begins at 11, to, to again remember to come here at 10 for the exam because 
10 to 11.50 is your exam time. And, uh, you, you know, it, if you review some beforehand, you'll have an idea of where to go to look. You know, you say, well, oh, okay, that was a question about quantity of pleasure. Let me double check. I think I know the answer. Let me double check if that was halfway through the British empiricism PowerPoint. Let me look at my printout from that. Or let me look at the printout of Mill's utilitarianism where he discusses that and it's highlighted. You know, you'll, you'll know where to go um, and be able to find some. Okay, well look, uh, 